wonderful. Thank you so much for the, the introduction and the very dramatic music, right? This is, yeah, quite the, quite the entry. Well, thank you so much to the panelists for joining me today for this really exciting topic. Um, we have Suleiman Mazrua, the Chief Executive Officer of the National Industrial Development Program. Thank you, Suleiman. Yeah. We have Emily Baudouin, who's the Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Pure Lithium. And we have Rod Eggert, the Professor of Economics and Business and the Coulter Foundation Chair in Mineral Economics at the Colorado School of Mines. And then virtually, we have joining us Kirill Dmitriev, the CEO of the Russian Direct Investment Fund. So thank you, Kirill, for joining us uh, online. So I'd like to kick this off with Suleiman. First to ask you, can you give us some of the big picture? What are the Vision 2030 targets regarding alternative and renewable energy targets? Thank you, Emily. Uh, before, let, let's go back to yesterday. Yesterday, we had many uh, good sessions, and a lot of lessons learned were captured there. And I want to start with that, if you allow me. First one was long-term planning works. Long-term planning mm -hmm. is the shortest path to destinations. Uh, we are seeing it. Uh, uh, we have seen it in uh, many of speakers and panelists speaking about how we must work on uh, discovery and exploration because this is the key to achieve net zero by 2060. Also, when it's coming to human capital planning, uh, R&D and research and development. So that's one of the main uh, key learning from yesterday. The second one is integration. Yeah. Integration that mining should not be developed in isolation of industry, of industry. And industry should not be in isolation of energy and energy transitions. And all of them should not be in isolation of supply chain and logistics. So integration cross mm -hmm. is uh, a key for the development of these uh, sectors. The third one was the private sector should always be on driving seat. The government provide the enablers, the incentives, the ease of doing mining. However, the private sector should be always in the diving seat for the development. And that's exactly what Vision 2030 provides. Yeah. First, a long-term plan with uh, a clear framework of circular carbon economy that was adopted by G20. A long-term game-changing initiatives, starting from uh, the uh, largest hydrogen plant in Neum uh, to uh, the energy efficiency program to the uh, EV manufacturing cars in King Abdullah in Economic City. So these just some of the game-changing initiatives that we planted to make sure that we achieve the targets. And our main target is to have 50% mm. of our power generation coming from renewable sources. That's tremendous. So that's, that's just uh, uh, one type of how we are addressing the long-term plan. The second is the integration. We have a program, NEDLIP, which is the main job is to integrate these four sectors, mining, industry, logistic, and energy in one program. Integration is what we do in the long uh, run uh, to make sure the lifetime of the development happening through the cross between these sectors. Wonderful. No, those are, those are such tremendous targets to have, and I know there's a, a really detailed plan in order to get there as well, which is so equally important. And moving down, Emily, what are some opportunities that you see here in the kingdom or in the region with regard to alternative energy and renewable energy? Well, it's a great question, and I'm so excited to be here for the first time. Um, the kingdom has an incredible opportunity to utilize their existing oil infrastructure to extract lithium from their oil well brines. And this isn't the lithium for the 30-year-old batteries that we're all sitting here using in our cell phone together. This is for the next generation of batteries, lithium metal batteries. You heard Professor Donald Sadaway, my co-founder, speak just a little while ago about the batteries we're working on at Pure Lithium. And we can make lithium from these oil field brines, and we can turn it into a battery electrode, which is the most important component for our battery. Why we're so excited is we see Saudi Arabia as an opportunity to deploy transformative technology in one country. Mm -hmm. So there's no battery infrastructure here. And the opportunity to leapfrog into the next generation battery because the materials are all here under the ground is so incredibly exciting. And there's a vision. 
Right. Oh, very cool. I had never heard about that until I spoke to you and about your company. Well, at the we invented it, so. Yeah. <laughs> I guess yeah. it would be weird then to have heard about it before. Yeah. yeah. No, that's really exciting. And Rod, how about you? What opportunities do you see here in the region, or here in the kingdom, but also in the region? Well, I too am excited uh, to be here in this exciting time for both the kingdom and the region, really, and the world as a whole in the in the area of minerals and energy. Uh, many opportunities. I would highlight three. Uh, first, uh, there's the potential for the kingdom and the region to become a leader in the production of sustainable hydrogen. And by sustainable, I'm not going to get confused and tied up in knots about colors, but, but I'm thinking about hydrogen taking advantage of solar, wind, uh, natural gas, uh, cleaner fuels, uh, and, and even more traditional fuels when we uh, link it with carbon capture, utilization, and storage. So that's one area. Uh, second opportunity, uh, using the sustainable hydrogen, become a global leader in the production of green metals. So metals that are lower carbon or zero carbon, uh, taking advantage of the, the local hydrogen uh, resource. And third, a little more broadly and upstream, uh, the potential for the region and the kingdom to become a leader in the production of raw materials and intermediate products that are used in the emerging energy technologies, ranging from major metals like copper uh, to emerging metals and, and uh, like lithium, but also nickel and cobalt, rare earth elements for use in magnets and internal electric motors. Yeah, there's just so much here and in the region, so much to be done, um, and such tremendous opportunities. But I wonder, Kareel, handing it over to you virtually, could you talk to us a little bit, perhaps, about some key barriers that you see to integrating alternative and renewable energies into the value chain? Yeah, well, uh, thank you for having me. And first of all, uh, of course, there are uh, several issues that need to be addressed. And the world is having a very fragmented supply chain right now. So ensuring that supply chain works and is not fragmented and opportunities in different countries uh, are used uh, to make sure that the world benefit as a whole uh, is very important. So I think fragmentation of supply chain uh, is definitely an issue. Uh, adaptation of new technologies. And I think here it's very important that Saudi Arabia committed very significant sums of money up to $1.3 trillion to explore uh, new untapped minerals in a very environmentally friendly uh, manner. So this access to uh, demand for new technologies and um, uh, funds and companies that are willing to pay for new technologies is important. Uh, and I think a third thing, uh, it's very important to think very broadly uh, because when we uh, really narrow to specific technologies as this whole green environment approach. I think that's just too narrow. And for example, Saudi Arabia has modern, which produces green fertilizer, uh, which has much lower cadmium content, really benefiting soils uh, in the world. So I think we need to think very broadly about, uh, you know, green technologies, including green fertilizer and other things like this. Uh, and also, I think uh, there is a market that needs to be developed and I'll finish uh, at that point of carbon uh, trading credits. Uh, because if you really think about the world as a whole, uh, you have Russia, which actually consumes most of the CO2 produced uh, in the world and 37% of its energy production is green. So I think the market for credits in uh, carbon needs to be developed. And I think this market will enable a much quicker adaptation of new technologies because there will be a funding base uh, and there will be a much easier way to pay for environmentally safe uh, approaches. Oh, thank you for that. And uh, Emily, I wonder if you have any thoughts on the same question of some of the key barriers that you see as well? Yes, I mean, there are numerous, numerous barriers, but to start at the top, it's storage. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in my lifetime, in everyone's lifetime in this room, we've had exactly two batteries that have been scaled 
to the gigawatt scale and beyond, and that is called lead acid and lithium ion. Lithium ion is a 30-year-old technology that was invented to power a cellular phone. It's a beautiful chemistry, Nobel Prize winning invention, but it is not a practical battery by any stretch of the imagination. In a single format, it's 7,500 individual cells in a Tesla, and that Tesla spends more energy cooling those cells than it actually does doing a lot of other work the PAC should be doing. We need a new battery. So we're here in this beautiful kingdom of Saudi Arabia with abundant solar power and no way to store it safely. Why are we going to put these batteries outside and use an air condition to cool them? That makes absolutely no sense, and it doesn't give you any gains insofar as carbon emission or economic benefits. So the first barrier is, is storage, and I will tell you that Professor Sadaway and I work on this every day. We're passionate about bringing new technologies to market. It's very, very difficult to do. So the second barrier that I want to talk about is the commodity cycle that we're in. So lithium right now in your lithium ion batteries comes in the form of a carbonate or a hydroxide, and it's a compound. So there's 18% lithium. It's not all metal, and that's all on one side of your battery. But because the industry has evolved for 30 years, there aren't new avail materials available to researchers. And when people people have a new technology, the investors say, well, wh where are you going to buy everything? What are you going to do? So it's sort of a, on one hand, it's a chicken and an egg problem, but the only way to get out of this box, this huge problem that we found ourselves in from this beautiful battery invention that changed our lives is to really think differently. Don't invent a battery that costs a lot of money. Don't invent something that uses unobtainium. Find locally sourced <laughs> supply chains and come up with different battery chemistries, metal-based battery chemistries that are inexpensive and scalable all over the world. We cannot rely on China anymore to supply the entire universe with batteries. We have different climate regions all over the world. You can make different batteries climate specific and you can save costs and be smarter with resources. So we just need to coordinate better. But the barriers, the barriers are a lot. But I love the unobtainium reference as an, as an avatar. Yeah, it's our, it's yeah. our joke, <laughs> <if> you're lithium. <laughs> <We're> like, <laughs> well, Rod, how about you? What are, what are some key barriers that you see in this space? Well, I'm an economist, so I will first and foremost uh, emphasize or, or highlight cost. Mm -hmm. uh, to be deployed commercially, anything needs to be cost competitive. Uh, another barrier is also on the commercial side, and that is that despite the, the large amount of press given to, to emerging energy technology issues, there's still a bit of a reluctance, I think, of the private investment community to, to jump in energetically. Uh, and then more in a technical realm, uh, I think the, the slow pace of, of converting inventions into scaled up commercially uh, viable and profitable uh, technologies. And I think government can play a, a key role in accelerating the, the piloting, the demonstrating, and the testing of uh, uh, ideas that seem to be a good idea in the laboratory, but fail to attract commercial investment because there's still a significant amount of technological risk as you go from the controlled environment of the laboratory to the more realistic environment of a large industrial facility. No, that's a, that's a great point, and I would imagine one of the key opportunities here in Saudi to integrate those two steps together, perhaps, so they move much faster. And I wonder, Suleiman, then, <clears throat> excuse me, if you could talk a little bit about how Saudi's green metals value chain is integrated in with the global value chain, because I know there's a, a really close connection there. Uh, definitely, but before we go to green, uh, I believe that with uh, material technologies, uh, development, advance, innovation, it will be hard to distinguish what's actually green metal because mm. most of the uh, metals will be on the green side. And that, that's what we aim to achieve. Uh, to us, I'll, I'll, I'll follow the uh, road side that commercial. Mm -hmm. We believe in demand supply mm -hmm. and we are looking to how to provide the global resilience with more supply. So we started our geological survey. We have a lot of untapped mineral in Saudi. Uh, 
that can contribute to the resilience of the global supply chain. And on the other hand, we are creating the demand. We have the EV manufacturing cluster ha uh, happening on the uh, King Abdullah economic city. And also, we have the highest target in renewables, where we will be need a lot of renewable uh, manufacturing and many renewable uh, equipments to actually power uh, uh, the kingdom. So we are working both supply and demand to make sure we uh, contribute on the innovation from one side to achieve uh, sustainability and from providing uh, the world with more metals through uh, the Arabian Shield. Mm. Oh, that's tremendous. And I know one of the other key barriers that we've mentioned at least once already is the barrier of financing or maybe just the restrictions of traditional financing to these types of opportunities. And Kareel, uh, going to you virtually, are there any alternative fo forms of financing that you see to fund new innovative projects as opposed to, again, the traditional structures that, that sometimes are resistant uh, to this new technology or new developments? Yeah, and uh, I agree with what has been said before that I think governments and sovereign wealth funds uh, can play a big role on this given the uncertainty uh, and what is uh, really needed uh, is sort of uh, demand for those technologies that is possible when government takes a longer uh, term view and is willing to pay and invest in those technologies long term. So I think what PIF is doing sometimes jointly with Madden uh, and separately is really quite remarkable because it's not only investment, but it's a huge base of companies that can use some of those new technologies. So I think as this uh, involvement of sovereign wealth funds and creative approaches, giving also demand for products that only governments and they can give is very important. Uh, and then, of course, traditional um, methods still work. Venture capital, of course, can be further developed in the MENA region. Uh, and we see great strides in this because I think it's very important that venture capital is not just based in, you know, one or two places uh, in the world. It has to be a global uh, approach. And we see that lots of venture firms are coming to the Middle East, are beginning to act in the Middle East. And I think that's important. Uh, and a third point, we do believe in huge opportunity, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, in uh, the big markets that will happen uh, when you have trading and carbon credits because once again, that enables capital to come into projects in the world that have the most cost efficient way uh, of uh, reducing CO2 emissions for the world. Uh, so we believe once that mechanism is developed and there will be a big uh, you know, COP27 conference in Abu Dhabi uh, this year that I think is going to give a big jolt uh, to those efforts, there will be a new financing mechanism available through that to many countries and many companies, which is just starting uh, to emerge. No, thank you for that. I know uh, I've been having lots of conversations in the last six months with venture capital groups in the US and, and other financiers that are finally starting to look at my name because they're looking at decarbonization. And it seems very recent, at least to me, that the money people are finally starting to put those two topics together. Emily, I'm sure you're it's, it, I, it's so interesting to me because the, the same people that just aren't interested in mining all use cell phones to right. do business, and yet they just don't seem to understand that investing in copper makes a lot of sense, but we you know, invested in Google and Facebook mm -hmm. and Instagram. So I've seen in New York some younger VCs, they're starting to really understand. And I'm fortunate to be inspired by Robert Friedland, who's our largest shareholder. And I've really learned a lot about mining in the last year. And there's so many good parts about it. Mm -hmm. But the VCs, like, I, I just don't understand the disconnect. And when I look at the prices of stocks and I see what people yeah. are buying, I just don't understand. Yeah. We have a lot of education, I think, to do. But I always tell people, you're, you're not interested in mining? Can I, can I have your phone? Yeah. Just give, give it to me, because I'm not going to give it back to you unless you sit here and listen to what I have to say about it. Yeah, and I think oftentimes people tell me, well, I don't, 
I don't understand mining, so that's why I don't invest in it, or I don't know anything about geology. And I usually turn it back to them and say, well, do you actually understand how a Tesla works? <laughs> because, you know, good it job. hasn't, it hasn't stopped one. anybody on, on that side. But Kareel, I saw you wanting to jump in as well. Did you want to share some thoughts? Yeah, I'll just give you one quick example, because the uh, production of key metals will need to increase five times in the next 20 years to catch up with demand. So definitely, it's a huge opportunity for investment. And another example of a very uh, interesting investment, because people need to understand how do you get good return on green investments, yeah. uh, is, for example, Modern doing green fertilizer. And Europe now is advocating green fertilizer, and people are willing to pay premium for green fertilizer. So this is an example where there is demand willing to pay premium for green products that enables for successful investment decisions to be made. And I think more people need to be aware of that. Uh, and I think more and more people are aware that green uh, investments uh, generate very good returns given much higher demand for green products worldwide. Yeah, and I think the other big trend that people sometimes miss is the general electrification of the planet, right? I mean, there's so much growth still in emerging and frontier markets just in the basic electri electrification of cities and as they grow and populations start to rely more and more on technology. Um, some, some key trends that hopefully for all of us in the room continue to, to make the, the market larger. Well, I wonder, we've got a few minutes left, so I'll start at the end. And Rod, is there anything else that you'd like to share uh, with the panel and with, with the audience on this topic? Uh, two things very quickly. First, uh, with regard to barriers to finance in particular, the next level of detail might emphasize the difference between large existing major metal markets like copper, which are reasonably well understood, mm -hmm. uh, but have challenges uh, with especially ESG considerations with new mine development. And then on the other hand, uh, the minor specialty metal and mineral markets like lithium and rare earths, uh, and even something called cobalt, where uh, the industry, the sector, the sectors are more opaque. It's more difficult for the broader invest community to, to do online research and get a level of comfort easily that makes them comfortable investing in that sector. Mm -hmm. uh, these small markets also are exposed to technology risk. A big risk with cobalt is, well, uh, if cobalt is substituted away from uh, in batteries, that's, the that's a major loss of market. And if, if, rare, if certain rare earth elements no longer become the state of the art in permanent magnets for electric motors, then that's a major, that's a technology risk that is difficult to, to understand. Yeah, I know uh, I, love, I love calling myself a mining futurist. And people oftentimes are like, well, what is that? But I think one of the cool things that you mentioned, Rod, is it's, it's really not just about how are we going to get the supply for the demand we have now, but what will the demand be for in 10, 15, 20 years, right? And, and you can only start to answer that question if you start to look closely at the technology that's being developed now for the world we all want for the next several decades, right? Only then can we as a mining industry anticipate and start to plan and do the exploration and development needed to have those minerals and metals um, for a few decades out. Yeah. Emily, did you want to chime in? Yeah, yeah, I mean, just sort of echoing what you are both saying is we need to think of the future. This conference is called the Future Minerals Forum, not the 30-year-old batteries that you're holding in your hand. So all of this opportunity, there's no sunk battery capital here. You have the opportunity to start from scratch deploy quickly and change the world. And I encourage everyone in this room to think differently, think for the future. Don't think about what you're holding in your hand today when you're making these decisions. Yeah. And Kareel, any thoughts from you? Uh, to well, I think it's great that again, Saudi Arabia is bringing so many people to think about this key topic for the world. And I think more and more people recognize Saudi uh, leadership in uh, energy generally, uh, but also important uh, leadership in bringing minds to think about green energy. So I think this is uh, important and will continue to engage to make sure the world becomes a greener place. Wonderful. Suleiman, what kind of thoughts do you have that we haven't discussed yet? 
Well, I, I think I'll still go back to yesterday when Dominic from Rio mentioned that metal is core for energy transition. Mm. We need more metals to achieve the net zero. And for us, I think balanced approach of environment, economic development, and energy security need to be added. And I think the circular carbon economy that masterfully by His Royal Highness Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman proposed and granted uh, approval in G20 is the key to achieve that balance for, uh, for all of us. Yeah, no, I think that's such a great point because it's not just what we need to do, but how we need to do it, right? And in that, um, some of you may know, I mentioned I host a podcast called On the Rocks, and I end every podcast by asking my guests the same question. So I haven't prepared any of the panelists for this one, so I apologize in advance. But it's an easy one, all right? So Rod, I'm going to start with you. If you could wave a magic wand and change one thing about the mining industry overnight, what would you change? No pressure. Awareness of the very important uh, social aspects mm. uh, of mineral development. Yeah, and just how critical it is, yeah. Emily? I was gonna say that mining just really needs a PR firm in general. <laughs> there, there's so many great things about it. I'll give you a quick example because I really didn't know much about it until a year ago. Um, there's a tailings pond somewhere in the world that a bunch of elephants really like. And some really bright woman figured out what bee those elephants hate and planted a whole bunch of beehives, and that made the elephants go away, and it solved the tailings pond problem. Mm. And I said to her, oh, that's great, and you know, there's some women selling honey, and she said, no, 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 it's literally the biggest exporter of honey in this country. Oh, wow. And I just got chills. There's a lot of really amazing impact that mining can have, and that's what I like to focus on when, in my discussions with people. Yeah, and I, I think it's one of the unique and wonderful things about this Future Minerals Forum as well, because it's so forward-looking and positive, and it really does present the industry in a different way. I love all the other mining conferences out there as well, um, but, but you know, this one is unique, and I think it has started to shift the way the world thinks about mining in a global way. Uh, Kareel, how about you? What would you change about the mi mining industry overnight? Yeah, I think it's this connection of uh, if you invest in green, uh, you make high returns and this makes market cap going higher. So basically, uh, I think lots of uh, mining companies are still very conservative. There is no connection that by investing in green, you make high return on your investment. And we in the world where that is true. And if people understand it, they'll start investing much more in green technologies. Yeah, absolutely. Education and understanding, for sure, economically and across the board. And Suleiman, you get to be the last one to answer. I gave you the most amount of time to prepare. <laughs> Thank you. I would say the image. Uh, moving from the cold image of, of miners to the smart mining approach, where everything is happening from uh, the control rooms, uh, whether the snake robots or the drones, where it's do most of the job and uh, create a very fulfilled jobs to our youth to actually drive this to the next generation. Yeah, I think it's, it's so important because we are so fundamental to the world's industries and just everything that we need every day to live and thrive. And yet people maybe don't understand the industry. In a lot of cases in America, don't even realize that we still mine. It's amazing when you talk to people and you say, I work in mining, and they say, oh, we still do that? <laughs> Or you have to clarify, not crypto, Bitcoin mining, like rock, <laughs> rock mining, mining, you know, and uh, yeah, the unique opportunities to travel the world, have wonderful adventures and work in a really key space. So thank you all so much for joining us. And I look forward to hearing the next conversation. Thank you.